if things feel tough for you, for anybody listening, it, just acknowledge that that's normal, right? And, and, and life is not meant to be easy necessarily, but it can, it can be easy. And the, and the secret lies between your head. Welcome everybody. Uh, today's guest is not only a retired Navy SEAL, speaker, coach, and best-selling author. He's an accomplished entrepreneur. He graduated as honor man in the number one, as the number one trainee in his graduating Naval SEAL class. Prior to becoming a Navy SEAL, he has a background as a certified accountant, an MBA in finance. But after realizing that he had another calling in life, he left his Wall Street job and a hundred-year-old established family business to start a journey of warrior and leader. His story military career was only the beginning of his journey as he has authored four books, including the New York Times bestseller, Eight Weeks to Seal Fit. Mark has also founded and ran successful ventures such as Seal Fit, Unbeatable Mind Academy, the Coronado Brewing Company, and U.S. CrossFit. His impressive accomplishments are due to his results-oriented approach, which is evidenced by the Seal Fit program, which took the pass rate for Naval candidates from 33% to over 80% on the physical screening test at Naval Boot Camp. His Kokoro Camp, which is used by special ops candidates, elite athletes, and civilian high achievers to break through to unprecedented levels of individual performance. It is my absolute honor to welcome today the creator of the top-ranked podcast, Unbeatable Mind, a black belt in Saito and Goju Ryu Karate, a senior ranking in Saito Ninjutsu, an expert in leadership, human performance, mental toughness, and physical ready, readiness, retired Naval, Naval SEAL Commander, Mr. Mark Devine. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Well, where'd you get that intro? Did, did we provide that for you? No, I, uh, I think it's just a collection of all the amazing things that you have actually, you know, done and listening. Dug to, deep into the kitchen sink there. That's yeah, awesome. yes. Welcome. <laughs> uh, it's incredible. It's an incredible resume. Uh, today, uh, Mark is here to help us talk about dealing with fear, conquering stress, learning to focus under high pressure situations and, and how to tap into high performance in, in stressful environments. And mm -hmm. uh, Mark has an incredible story to share, perhaps maybe just giving us a little bit of background and uh, an idea how all this evolved from the beginning. Oh, man. How many hours do we have? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier to Mark, uh, if, I, if I talk too much, let me know, because we could obviously listen to Mark talk all day. <laughs> well, you, um, you're Canadian. You, you know, the, um, you kind of know where my stomping ground was in upstate New York. It was, it was one of those areas that, you know, in retrospect, was beautiful and, and a powerful place to be from, um, not a place that I would want to be at right now, necessarily. My town uh, where I grew up was about 375, you know, peeps, good people, farmers, uh, you know, salt of the earth type folks. And um, I think my saving grace is that we, we'd go to this, this summer home that was in, been in the family along with this family business for over 100 years. You kind of mentioned that. So we had a little bit of a privileged uh, lifestyle in that sense. And we, you know, I didn't have to go get a job after college. If I didn't want to, I could have come back to the family business. You know, and I think that affects my psychology because I was kind of expected to actually, you know, so that was the condition, you know, the, the clay of my mind was conditioned to be a business guy, certainly not a, a military guy. And, um, but probably, you know, when you look back in your life, you, you can, and if, if you were asked to say, okay, what were the, you know, to characterize the three or four most formative things, right? So for me, probably the most formative thing about my childhood was, Super small rural town, very, very few, if any, people that I kind of felt really connected to. You know, I just wasn't like them. I wasn't a farmer. I wasn't interested in that kind of work. Um, and so that was unique. And so I spent a lot of time outside. And then to exacerbate the desire to be outside in the wilderness usually on my own was the fact that what was happening on, on, you know, happening in the household under the roof was unpleasant to say the least, you know? So we were one of those families that was 
probably pretty fairly typical that looked great on the outside. You know, the wrapper was really pretty nice. You know, even the name Divine was pretty nice. And <laughs> and we lived in the biggest house in town and we had the business, and, you know, and everything was pretty nice. And I was, I had enough raw material to do really well in school and all that. But, you know, there was nine generations of alcoholism in my family and lots of abuse. My father was very abusive um, emotionally and physically. And so, you know, we dealt with that, my siblings and I. And we didn't, you know, I just thought it was normal, of course. And, and that brought me some really uh, interesting benefits. One of the benefits was that, you know, Stacey, you, you really, um, it's difficult, and I'm sure listeners who've grown up in certain, you know, with a similar scenario would agree, it's difficult to hurt people like us, right? We've become so extraordinarily well defended. Um, we get used to emotional pain and you could say that we develop really thick skin and guess what you know what seal trainees need or sas trainees need they need friggin thick skin so so later on in my life i recognized that wow what a blessing and, and in fact you know from a spiritual perspective i probably got exactly what i asked for coming into this life because i was meant to be a warrior um and so that was kind of the this it brings me to the second most of interesting or formative aspect of my life story. So I, I did this kind of average or common upbringing in upstate New York. And I, you know, I did the sports and I did the, I, you know, I, everything I'm talking about, I got outside and I learned to be really comfortable out in nature. And I became, you know, kind of like an outdoors person where I used to love to run and ruck and hike, you know, and be, be in the wilderness alone, mainly to keep, get the hell away from my family. <laughs> and that led to, um, you know, so, some success in, in college. I got into a good college called Colgate University. And I was a competitive athlete there, swimmer, rower. And I had enough good um, things kind of stacked in my favor to get a, a job down in Manhattan with all of my fraternity brothers who were far better students and far more confident than I was because, you know, they weren't dealing, at least I wasn't aware of them having dealt with some of the uh, family issues that I had dealt with, which, you know, led to a lot of uh, subterranean uh, lack of confidence and shame and stuff like that, you know, which uh, I now know is fairly common. And um, and so I followed this herd down to New York City and I started working. And as you know, from reading my book, I became a certified public accountant and I got my MBA, Master's in Business Administration at NYU Stern School of Business. And so, you know, everything seemed to be going in the right direction. My parents were just thrilled. And I was holding up this facade of, of being the perfect student, the golden child, getting all the great, you know, getting these pedigrees and, um, and making a lot of money. And, you know, I'm going to just, just crush it. Right. And I was, you know, my mom was, you know, I was her trophy child. And so that brings me to the second most powerful thing that ever happened in my life was besides that formative upbringing was I, um, I walked into a martial arts studio and I met my first true mentor who was also a meditation, you know, Zen master. And so um, because I trusted this guy and I saw something really unique in him, something different, something I'd never seen another human being before. Um, I saw the, the qualities of an enlightened being, you know, someone, you know, who wouldn't characterize himself as that. He was extraordinarily humble, showed up every day to teach, you know, his literally he had hundreds of thousands of students around the world, but you know, he would show up every day at his headquarters in Manhattan to teach blind kids and, and uh, white belts and then also his black belt class. And then this one little tiny meditation class every Thursday night for an hour. And so I joined that class with a bunch of other black belts. And um, I learned how to meditate effectively through the Zen process. And there's something about it. The reason I stuck with it was it, it really reminded me of being out in nature alone. You know? and, it, and so I had this in my mind, I had this real um, experience, the real contrast between the way I felt and the way my mind behaved when I was alone in nature for long periods of time versus the way my mind and emotions behaved when I was in the chaos of the household with all the triggers and, and, um, and emotional drama. And so while I was in Manhattan, I kind of equated the chaos in my family to the cacophony of the streets and the business and all the drama that went on in the, in the work environment. And then when I would come and do my hardcore training session and then sit on that little meditation bench, that was, I had the same experience. 
a similar, I should say, not quite exactly the same, but a similar experience as to when I would escape in the wilderness in upstate New York. And so it made me feel good. It, it provided this really nice balance for me. And I felt grounded when I did it. And so I decided to do it every day. And this is 1985, right? Before anyone in really talking about meditation. No YouTube YouTube really, videos. Yeah, there weren't, yeah, we didn't even have YouTube. There was no internet. And so I, um, I feel extraordinarily fortunate to have found mental training through Zen meditation and a martial art at 21 years old. And so now we know what happens with the, the brain when you start, especially at a, you know, at a young age, it's right. The perfect time for an individual to start meditating, because if you do it too early, you're really not going to have the motivation. You're not going to have the, um, the ability to focus your mind for longer periods of time. You're just not developed enough, but right around that early twenties, you know, before your mind is developer brain is fully developed and 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 if you if you trained yourself in athletics you've got the ability to um you know hold your attention for you know 45 minutes to an hour man meditation taken up at that point gives you a huge leg up in life because it literally start, transforms the structure of your brain as is as your brain is developing whereas if you take it up if you're 50 or 60 and we know that through the um, concept of neuroplasticity that you're your brain structures can change and you can grow, you know, synaptic connections and you can, you can affect a lot in the brain, but you've got to also um, deconstruct a lot, right? Because you've got all these patterns and these deep ruts of behaviors and thinking patterns that you build up over the years. Well, when you're 21, you don't have those, you know, they're, they're very light. And so you, and so I had these extraordinary experiences probably more extraordinary experiences in my early 20s meditating than I have even to this day. Now, uh, I've, I've never stopped meditating. It's been a daily practice for me. The, the form has changed, but you know, the, the quality of the meditation now is very different. You know, it's just like when you start physical training, you have these great leaps and bounds and you have, you know, I, I could look at a weight and pop a muscle out of my, you know, abs, you know, back then. And, uh, and so you have this massive transformation that happens early on, and then everything kind of stabilizes and you're looking for just these like, you know, the little peaks through. and valleys of the experience. So that was, you know, I went down to New York thinking that I was going to be a trader or an investment banker after I finished this, you know, brief tour as a CPA, MBA, you know, get some really great work experience under my belt. And then and make a lot of money and then maybe uh, go back and run the family business. You know, that was the story that I was telling myself. That was the story I was fed. After two years of meditating, I had shit canned all of that. I literally deconstructed that entire story because I, I learned through the meditation process that that wasn't who I was, that I was living someone else's, someone else's story. And, and so I started asking better questions, started um, investigating my internal dialogue, you know, everything I talk about in Unveil Mind began on that meditation bench in my early 20s. And all the processes and practices that I eventually codified, you know, started to be revealed to me. And mostly through my own um, self-discovery and some through Nakamura and then others later on through, um, a, you know, a, a deep uh, practice of um, studying, you know, anything I can get my hands on related to meditation and Zen and eventually got into yoga, all the different yoga uh, practices and looking at their view of mental disciplines and, and then getting into emotional development, emotional control, because I had to unwind a lot of the damage done by my family of origin in order to flourish. Cause I wasn't, even though I was very, very strong mentally and very capable and number one Navy SEAL at, you know, at the SEALs, I still had a lot of emotional baggage that I was dragging around that was holding me back and, and, uh, and causing me to kind of uh, disrupt my plans, so to speak. So I could keep going on, but those, so the, that, that foundational kind of growing up in this chaotic, abusive family, but having this contrast of being of nature to realize, wow, you know, everything's kind of, nature is the ultimate guru. Everything's peaceful when you're out there because you know, you just kind of resonate and, and, and vibrate at a different level when you're alone in nature. And everyone knows, everyone, especially in Australia, kind of knows this. But um, modern day, boy, it's certainly been lost. It's 
you know, one of the first places to start to get healthy is to spend a lot more time outside. You know, it's so yeah, especially with social media and all the distractions that are yeah. people are carrying around, you know, their phones. We're, we're barreling fast in the wrong direction. Are we with that? I think the term that you describe that is the, the boo philosophy yeah. in the background of obvious. obvious. Yeah. And uh, I think most people are carrying all this programming and wearing masks and, and, being somebody maybe who they aren't really and right. for to, to satisfy other people's you know wants desires or programming whatever that may be so that led you to Nakamura and I believe Saito the name Saito means an enlightened warrior is that the, the you know Saito Saito yeah, that's a really good question it's the way of, um, what was it? I know you, you talked about the difference. He, he left, he was with another yeah. party and there was. Well, a right. He was with a hardcore fighting art called Kokenshai, Pure Koshinkai, which a lot of people know about. And that was, the founder of that was a guy named Masayama, who was famous for cutting the horn off of a charging bull with his hand. So when I learned that and I started investigating the martial arts, it was very inspiring, right? Because I had just, upstate New York, you know, I didn't really understand the power of the human mind or the power of the human being when it really radically focuses on developing certain skills. It's extraordinary, right? And there was literally no limits because we, we do get to create our reality. And so if you want to chart, you know, cut the bull horn off, you train to cut the bull horn off and you'll be able to do it. And I watched Nakamura crack five blocks of ice with his head. And these blocks of ice were like almost a foot thick each, or maybe, maybe six inches to set this, eight inches thick each. And they were stacked on top of each other, separated just by, by a little tiny piece of wood. I watched him in Madison Square Garden, literally just stare at these rocks or these ice blocks, take a deep breath, arch backward and just thrust his forehead down like an axe on the top brick of ice and they all just kind of wow. shatter. It would have killed an average man, right? And he just walked away, um, not even concussed. Wow. It's extraordinary, right? What's capable. And then I learned about the yogis later on. I took up yoga while I was a SEAL in 1999. So I started training uh, with SEAL training in 1990. Um, was an officer and so 10 years later nine years later I was looking for another martial art because now I'm in Coronado California and so um, I found uh, Goju Ryu and it was close enough to Sado that it took me you know not very long to pick up my showdown my black belt I'd gotten my black belt with Nakamura and, you know to finish that story because I kind of jumped ahead 10 years but um and I'll come back to Goju so I trained with Nakamura for four years and during that time, I meditated, you know, pretty much every day, every Thursday night with him for an hour with a small group. And that same group, uh, we would go to the Zen Mountain Monastery twice a year for these four or five day retreats where we kind of have this yin yang, really cool training where we do, you know, two hours of hardcore karate training. And then we go sit in meditation and then we'd have lunch and, and silence and wash dishes with the monks, you know, and then go back out, get our asses kicked doing karate <laughs> and then sit in meditation again. And it was wickedly cool. And I had some major breakthroughs. And so through all that process, you know, I had this transformation that I was talking about where I, I woke up basically at my, my calling, my, my real story, and that was to be a warrior. And I tell that story in my book, The Way of the Seal. How then, I, then I was really led to the Navy SEALs. It wasn't like I grew up like a lot of these kids watching movies and, and we didn't know anything about the SEALs back yeah. then. In, in fact, the recruiters even tried to deter me. <laughs> <laughs> the recruiters are scared shitless of the seals and they're like you don't want to be one of those guys you know they're, they're real you know so you left uh, wall street yeah so i left in 99 1989 i got my mba cpa and i tested for my black belt all in that month in november and at the end of the month i was out of there literally i went to officer canada school i was on a train to newport rhode island I'd finally gotten into the Navy, one of two people selected that year from the civilian world to go directly into the SEAL program as an officer through Officer Candidate School. 
the, the statistic chance of me getting that were pretty slim because there were a lot of interested parties at the time. Um, but it was one of those things that I, I knew it was going to happen. Like once I discovered through meditation that my calling was to be a warrior, and then I radar locked on the seals as the way I was going to fulfill that calling. And then I used my meditative practices and I layered in visualization to at the end of my meditation practice. So I had this, this kind of stacked practice and I did it every single day. And the meditation practice um, that prepared me for the visualization to be done at a very, very deep uh, you know, soul level where it was affecting, you know, basically the, the matrix of my very being. And that was seeing myself accomplishing BUDS, Navy SEAL training, basic underwater demo SEAL training, seeing myself going through the training and graduating and, and just thriving, you know, not, not struggling at all, just literally thriving. And the imagery that I had to work with then was literally a recruiting video, just one recruiting video on a cassette. You know what I mean? I was you just going to ask, did you have any idea of what you were headed into? Yeah, that was it. Like we didn't, and I had a, a couple of Vietnam era books, which weren't very helpful, but I did have this imagery of, uh, that was like 1970s of, you know, SEAL training. And it had, you know, each phase of training and, you know, they put together kind of mock drills or mock, you know, uh, missions. And I got a good sense of what it would be like from that. And I put myself into that video and I visualized that every single day as a first, like a first person shooter game. It was me doing the work, me going through that training, me jumping out of the airplanes, me doing the dives, me sitting there on, on graduation day. And the more I practiced it, the more real it got, the more I felt it. Um, and then, about eight, nine months or so into that practice and I was diligent about it and I was just going on pure blind faith you know what I mean I was like this is going to be part of my practice I had had visualization training from my swim coach in college so I and I had a cool experience with that so I trusted it enough and I was kind of a no holds you know uh, no no stone unturned kind of guy you know what I mean it's like once I commit to something I'm going to do everything in my power to make it happen and I found that out in this process. I'm like, I, I'm going to do everything I can physically, but that's not enough, right? Because the, the game is one up here. So I don't, again, I don't know what taught me that except for meditation, right? It just simply had no teacher like we have today and no podcast, no books teaching this stuff. I just said, I just knew that the answer lied in my mind and that I could create the conditions for success that I now call winning in my mind, which you mentioned earlier. And so nine months into this practice, and this is all while I'm in New York. I had this, um, this feeling kind of wash over me. Um, it took like two to three days where it just felt more and more like, wow, I, you know, I am definitely going to be a Navy SEAL. And prior to that, even the week prior, you know, my mental dialogue and the feeling was I want to be a Navy SEAL really badly. Right. And then I, and then it shifted, like something shifted in the, in the matrix right to use the, <laughs> to use the metaphor something shifted to where the universe accepted my accepted my declaration let's say because the imagery that i worked with um created a like a memory of a future event that hadn't happened yet and the more and more i practiced that memory the more and more real it became to my both my nervous system as well as my psychology as well as my my, the entire energy of me as a human being. And so I knew that I was going to be a Navy SEAL. I didn't know exactly how it was going to happen because I hadn't even been admitted to the Navy yet. But about a week after I had that feeling wash over me, the recruiter called. And up until this point, he was telling me not to get my hopes up because not only was I doing things to kind of screw myself, that's the kind of a different story, but um. He said, there's a lot of other great candidates, you know, and this is an extremely competitive process. And so he didn't have high hopes, but, you know, there's three he got the call that, and that I got the call. Me. One is that you mentioned as each day went on through buds, you felt stronger and stronger where other guys were dropping off like flies. You felt that it was empowering you every single day. You were getting that much better. That's right. And then also, and correct me if I'm wrong, your boat crew was the only time that the full crew graduated with the final class? 
yourself that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously the, the team mentality forged during that training and everybody came together. But that's, that, that says a lot, obviously, about the team mentality. And then also uh, at the end, not only graduating, uh, so 180 candidates came out of BUDS into, tra into SEAL training. Is that correct? 185 in my class. 185 in your class and only 18 graduated. Yeah. And you were the number one honor SEAL in that graduating class. Right. And I, I, I put, you know, I give meditation again. I, I don't want to sound like I'm selling meditation, but ultimately I've learned over the years that everything, everything in our lives is created first in our mind. And we think it's the other way around, right? We think that we, and we just kind of enter into the world and then, then things happen to us. The reality is we create the conditions for the world to show up to us. In fact, our entire experience of the world is in our mind. And um, once, you, once you kind of wrap your head around that, you recognize that you get to create the outcomes that you want to. Now, it does take effort or perceive it effort, but what happens is once you declare that, once you set the intention and it's non-negotiable to yourself, then it gets easy. It's, it, it becomes really easy. And it's easy because the universe has already said, okay, well, this guy is going to do this regardless. Um, there's going to be, you know, there might be some lessons in the, you know, along the way, but they're not the kind of lessons that are, are uh, the typical, you know, hero's journey lessons. Um, because you've already learned a significant um, lesson just in that intentional declaration, right? The problem, the reason a lot of people have such struggles in their life is they're not clear about what they want and, and they're not intentional about going after it. They're, they're lukewarm and half-assed and they're always hedging their bets. And so, you know, you, you know, maybe, you know, obviously you've heard the idea of burn your boats commitments, right? Yep. When you decide to do something, first off, it has to be the right thing or else you are going to suffer. You know what I mean? So, so the, the choice is extremely important, right? And so this is why that idea of measure twice, cut once, you know, is really true and important, right? There's a, a bazillion things that we can do and a place we can put our attention in life. Choose wisely. You should take 90% of your time in your mind space, figuring out where to put your attention. And then the rest of that time, 10% of the time, put your attention with all your energy and you'll just knock it out of the park, right? But if you take 10% of your time and you choose the wrong thing, then you're gonna spend 90% of your time in real suffering and struggle. And you might have some level of success, but you're not gonna have the happiness or the true success or lasting success because it's not the right thing for you. And we see great existential crisis all over the world because people are doing things that they're not supposed to be doing from a spiritual or soul callings perspective. And our entire economies are structured to keep people kind of trapped and dependent upon the system because you got to earn money. And so you, you find yourself basically feeling enslaved to a system, you know, which causes great suffering when your spirit just wants to fly as a creator or to be out there as a Navy SEAL or a warrior or to be you know, whatever, serving as a, um, a public servant, you know, in the health, whatever it is, right? And so the, the concept, finding I, that, sorry, sorry, Mark, I was just going to say yeah, one of the things that you just mentioned that, and you talk about in your book and, and having the total commitment mentality. And then obviously once you burn the boats and make that commitment, it reveals the gaps right. in yourself of where you need to, to address, to move forward. And you, I, I was sort of hoping you'd have the, uh, the wolf in the background, the two wolves. I know. Sorry Eating about the, that. The, the wolf I have that in my courage. office. I don't have it. Um, Cause it, you know, the, the extreme competence in you can choose to feed one of two wolves. Maybe you can expand on that. Cause obviously sure. you, went, you came out of buds, you, you went into seal training. You've, you've fast forwarded through all your, training and missions 
Um, but all, all of that is the same concepts of, of winning in your mind first. They do the tactical training. You, you, feed, you feed the wolf of courage. If you're, mm -hmm. you know, the quote that you talked about was when you feed fear, you preclude success from ever happening. That's right. Yeah, so fear and negativity are really the same, right? It's, um, it's, a, it's a quality of the mind that is protective, right? It's, it's basically for survival, you know, we know that. And, and so we spend a lot of our time and we're taught things that are fear-based and negative, but they often have a little polish to them. And so we become unaware that they're negative, right? So if you think of most of what we see on social media is negative wrapped in a positive, you know, shiny wrapper. Because it's, you know, it causes judgment, you know, and it causes comparison. And it's elevating one pe person above another. And it is, um, and also there's a lot of um, posturing and fighting, you know, um, violence you know, word violence going on in our social media, right? And so it's all negative. The news, many network news in every single country is negative. Our medical system is negative, right? Our legal system is negative. Every word that comes out of every politician's mouth is negative and, and also false. So anything that's false or, or a lie is negative, even if it's, you know, uttered with the most slippery, you know, loving words, you know, which are not loving. They're, they're you know, it's manipulation, right? Yeah. And so we're just utterly surrounded by negativity and fear and linear thinking, you know, which I, what I mean by that is cause and effect, you know, I'm going to, and so everyone is basically trained mentally to be defensive. And I was no different, right? Growing up, you know, my, my, my family was very negative and very defensive. And they, um, their rapper on that was sarcasm. And there was a lot of humor, but it was very negative and damaging humor. And I participated in the fully because I didn't know anything different until I learned, well, how, that was really bad, right? And so it wasn't until I started meditating that I saw these, um, this inner dialogue and the, the way it made me feel and the lack of confidence that was just, it just kept grooving into me. And so then, then that lack of confidence was compensated with, you know, what I regret to say was the arrogance that came out in my late teens and early twenties that I had to, you know, really come to terms with. And in spite of this, I, you know, I had all the success that people would normally say was success, right? I became a number one Navy SEAL of my training command. And, and I was a really good guy, but inside I had to fight these, this dialogue that was going on. And so I started to really take a hard look at that and, and to ask questions to myself and to, and to th ask myself or to see if I could eradicate this. And so the way I, I started eradicating it was literally a um, internal a mantra, right? The literally, I, I didn't know what a mantra was until I started studying yoga, but I started this mantra practice. And I, I became obsessed with it, right? I, I was like, I'm going to literally crowd out any negative thought with this positive mantra. And I had a couple of them. And I, anytime I did anything hard, you know, like I started a hard run and the negative thought would pop in, I'd crowd it out with this mantra and I just kept on doing it. And, I, and over time, I started to notice that the negative loops of dialogue would, um, would kind of come up less often. And eventually they disappeared. Right? So it didn't mean that all of the emotional trauma that um, I'd had in my life that caused some negative things to happen had gone away. But all the mental conditioning, the cognitive uh, psychological conditioning of negativity started to dissipate. 
And it's, you know, you have to look at it like melting ice, right? So I was, I was just showering all that negativity with positive energy, which had a higher vibrational quality and just melted the negative shit right out of me. And so that's what I mean by, you know, the metaphor of the wolves, of course, is from the Native American kind of tradition where they talk about the wolf of fear, you know, being residing in your head, the wolf of courage residing in your heart. And the wolf of fear is dominant because we're all stuck in our head. You know, all of our education, all of our training, you know, is, is basically training the, the head, you know, and, and we, and most people, their locus of control, their entire world is right up here in their head. And they often leave their bodies behind. I know you, you and your audience don't, but you know, most people don't really take care of their bodies. It's a foreign thing to them. They just kind of drag it around with them. It's a nuisance. And you know, we have 45% obesity rate in, in America. I don't know what it's like down in Australia. It's probably it's not that, but it's, it's insane. It's going to be over 50% of the population within a few years. That's negative. That's someone who has a negative thought or self-concept, right? So that's what I mean. They're not feeding the courage wolf. They're stuck in their head. They can't possibly be in their heart feeding the courage wolf because they're completely disconnected from their body. And they've got a negative dialogue and negative self-image and they've got negative habits around eating. And so they're, they're negative people. Now, regardless of what words come out of their, their mouth, they've trained themselves to say, you know, it, we have to be really honest and clear about what we're talking about here. Negative energy destroys performance and it destroys health. So if you talk to yourself negatively, you're, you're basically hurting yourself. Every word you utter that's negative, right? It has a vibrational, it's like an arrow going right into the heart of your, um, you know, the, the energetic engine of your being, right? And it's just matching you down a level of, of your life force energy. So I found, I, I learned that, you know, by just examining my own life, my own internal dialogue. You know, and the metaphor goes when, it, you know, the, the story says the kid asked this elder, you know, about these two wolves. And the elder saying, you know, the fear wolf is dominant in most people. And, um, and he goes, but it doesn't have to be because these wolves, you know, are often fighting each other and the courage wolf wants to, you know, have a say in things. So the courage wolf, you know, going to fight for some attention. You got to feed the courage wolf in order for that to have any kind of chance of fighting back against the fear wolf. And the one that ultimately wins is the one that you feed the most. Right. So in order to, to develop courage and positive, you know, positive mindset and positive overall state of being, you feed the courage wolf. And in so doing, you starve the fear wolf. And the more you feed the courage wolf, the more you, less food you're giving psychologically to the fear wolf. And over time, like I said, you just start to live a lot lighter, you know, and that, that's the quality that I saw in Nakamura. Like he was one of the most positive individuals I've ever met. Like he literally was a light hearted human being. And he was, he would laugh a lot, you know, and this is the guy that could kill, you know, kill you with his finger, just like people say about me, but, you know, I would not want to screw with this guy. He's a 10th degree black belt. My boys were training. talking about that this morning. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And people, like I said, people say that about me, but if I don't want to mess with someone, then you know that person. <laughs> and, um, but he was like, I, he would like break into laughter you know, at the slightest humor that was shed in class. And so he just had this incredible lightness of being and very positive because he had fed his courage well for many years and he had cultivated his mindset to be very, very aware of what's going on inside of it. This is the core principle of Mandil Mind is develop the awareness to pay attention moment to moment to the quality of your thoughts and your emotions and to eradicate the negative very deliberately, we use that uh, worm process, W-I-R-M process that I talk about in the book, which is a process of taking direct control over your mental dialogue and your emotional states and, and maintaining a positive attitude. I guess that leads His to big the, big, the big four. Yeah. Which uh, I think regardless of where people are at, whatever they're doing, the big four would apply to anybody in any situation on a on a even a moment to moment basis maybe you can expand on that a bit absolutely so we talked about let me let me 
like frame this up so that people can get the training value because it, it, it's fun to tell stories, but how do we apply it in our daily lives? So feeding the courage wolf, the skill there is to monitor. There's a few sub skills here, but we kind of wrap it into one master skill. It's to develop the capacity to monitor your thoughts in real time. Now it takes effort and time to be able to do that. So we start by doing it in a practice period that we call meditation. Right? And that's really what, you know, what we're trying to do with meditation is to calm our mind down enough so that we can then literally set up shop and be able to watch the quality of our thinking in real time and then curate that quality, right? So that when you notice something negative or, or notice your attention being drawn away from what you're trying to focus on, then you're able to interdict that and to focus, you know, bring it back to the, the, you know, to what it is you're supposed to focus on. I mean, this skill alone, you could say is probably why it was number one in my SEAL training class, because I, you couldn't distract me. I was just radically focused because I was, had moment to moment awareness of where my mind was at. That's a master skill. And then the, the, the secondary skill there is make sure that what you're curating, you're curating it, you're out the negative and in, the, in with the positive, out with the fear, in with the courage, out with the distraction, in with the focus, right? So you're, you're always going toward the higher vibrational quality, the more positive um, response, which often is silence the more aware response and uh, more aligned with your mission, right? This skill has the corollary outcome of helping you make much better decisions at a strategic level, which is to what we're gonna put our attention toward our mission and the tactical level, which is to how do I keep my attention focused on the, you know, on the objective during the act of performing, you know, the steps or the stages of that mission. That's all one of the big four skills, the second one. Now, you can't possibly develop that level of mental control if your body's full of stress and not healthy, right? This is why, you know, I'm unique in the sense, and uh, I'm sure you are with the way you train and communicate to your uh, people who listen to you, you have to have your body in a state of balance in order to develop that level of mental uh, power and mental control. Because the brain is part of your body. And if the body is out of balance because it's unhealthy or because you're sleep deprived or because you're eating like shit, then your brain is going to be unhealthy too, right? It's literally not going to be operating in a You can't separate operating. the two. You cannot, right. Body, brain, same, same. And body, mind... Same, same too, right? So the mind is just the cognized experience of the body, you know, moving throughout the world and making sense of the sensory input, right? And so we, we treat them separately, but ultimately it's, this, it's co-arising. Body and mind co-arise moment to moment. And so the first of the big four skills, I already talked about the second, but I'll come back and re reframe it. The first is to develop the capacity to um, get back into balance and to remain in balance. And we use the breath as our primary tool for that. But it also includes at a meta level, you know, eating well, sleeping well, all the kind of like peak performance things that you know, we know how to do, but a lot of people don't do, right? Yeah. And so let's say we do do those things. You know, we, we, we get our sleep dialed into seven and a half, eight hours a night, and we dial in our nutrition, we dial in our exercise. And so the body and the brain start to get really healthy. Then we use the breath through controlled breathing, controlled nostril breathing. And, and we train ourselves to slow our breathing down using controlled nostril breathing to six cycles per minute or six breaths per minute. And we use a practice called box breathing for that, which we pioneered and, and started teaching to the SEALs in about 2006. And um, what that does is it de-stresses you both over the long term, keeps you in a, a proper homeostatic balance, also 
uh, de-stresses you in the moment when, you know, when you're triggered into a stress or aroused state. And so when you're, let's give an example of when I was at SEAL training and instructors drop a freaking you know, shit bomb on us, it's supposed to take us all out of our comfort zone and th crazy things are going on, like the breakout of hell week and, and people are freaking out because they're out of control, right? Their mind's out of control. Now their bodies are spinning out of control and the adrenaline, the cortisol, everything's spiking and they're missing things because their vision is you know, now narrowed. Everything's going wrong. And these things get compounded because the instructor knows they the instructors know exactly what they're doing and they know this is happening and they just make it worse and worse and worse, the pig pile on. And then what they're waiting for is to find out where's the person's breaking point or where's the team's breaking point. And what I knew going into this was that the only way they could break me is if I allowed them to. And the only way I, that would happen is if I got if I lost control of my breath. If I lost control of my breath, I'd lose control of my mind. And the two were inextricably linked. And so I, I developed this, practice, this breath practice already through my training with Nakamura and I doubled down on it because I recognized the value of it literally the first day of training. And that became like my center post. As long as I could maintain control of my breathing and keep it slow and controlled and through my nose, then I could keep control of what was going on between my ears, right? And that led me, so that was my, the foundation or the, the baseline for me to move into the second skill, which is feeding the courage wolf and maintaining a positive mindset while I was going through whatever shit storm, you know, was happening in the context of seal training is whatever the instructors cooked up for us. And the rest of my life, it's been, you know, whatever challenges in front of me, right. Come back to the breath and develop the most positive internal dialogue and imagery and, and, um, and focus on, the task at hand with that attitude. So that was this, those are the first two skills, breath control and positive internal dialogue and, 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 um, and, and attitude essentially. The third skill we talked about earlier is the use of imagery, right? So we can use imagery in a future state to create the conditions for the, for winning in our mind before we go out and, and step foot in the battlefield. And I already described how that worked with uh, future state memory development, right? And so when you get a clear picture of what you want to accomplish or what you who you need to be in order to accomplish a certain big thing, you know, like becoming a Navy SEAL or you know launching a business of your own or getting that doctorate or master's degree or whatever it is, college degree you basically create a future image of what that looks like and you make a movie out of it in your mind's eye and you can have a you know, first person or second person or third person view of it. All three are fine. And, um, and then you practice it just like you would practice a sports, uh, uh, you know, visualization, you know, just like they do in the NFL or something, but you practice this in a much more generalized sense to become or to accomplish something. And what you're doing is you're creating a memory just like you have a memory of a past event. And if you go obsess about a memory of a past event, it's gonna, it's gonna really come alive for you and you're not gonna be able to get rid of it, you know? So it's like people who have break, hard breakups or, you know, they have really things that, that really traumatize them and they keep on going back and reliving those memories and it just keeps it more and more alive and actually exacerbates it because you're adding energy to that. So, you know, for things that you don't want to remember at that level because they're damaging or painful, you don't keep feeding the energy. You have to decharge them, discharge them. So you take the energy away. There's a process to do that. And you can then reinforce the positive things in your past, but still we're working with the past energy, right? And so there's a way to, to give yourself more energy in the present by decharging the negative things and, and amping up the positive thing. And that's all well and good. But the real juice comes from creating a memory of a future that you strongly desire. And again, remember, I said it's got to be the right future, right? It's got to be based upon your true calling in life, which takes a lot of time and effort to really uncover. And so that's the third skill is you've now developed over time this memory. And now whenever you get into a really stressful situation, this third skill becomes your motivator, right? Because now you just reimagine, you remember essentially why you're doing this. 
why this is happening to you? Why did you put yourself through this torture of SEAL training? I mean, everybody wants to be a Navy SEAL on a, on a sunny day, right? But I tell you what, four <laughs> months or five months into training and you've got your ass beaten down, you know, for 300, you know, or, or 180 or 50 days or whatever, 120 days. And you just can't even see the end because you got another four or five months left. And there's a moment that everyone's going to have where they're like, what the fuck was I thinking? Yeah. I was just going right? to ask you, what was your moment or what? I didn't, what, I didn't have it. That's, you, you didn't I, have I didn't it. have it because <clears throat> I, I had this memory in my mind that I had already become a Navy SEAL. Was there, anytime, was there a worst part of the program for you at all? No, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed the training. I enjoyed the people. Um, I, I actually love seeing the class get smaller and smaller and smaller because yeah. it made me feel stronger and stronger, energized. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It really energized me. Um, I did get a little, you know, my back then, my, I didn't know and nobody knew frankly about nutrition the way we do today. Right. And so even the seals fed us like shit. Now they're really dialed in. We didn't have any human performance program or, you know, we were just like, really treating our bodies like shit beating the crap out of our bodies and buds and eating pizza and drinking beer on the weekends you know what i mean we <laughs> i i just uh on it that. was old school and so by the end of third phase man i was my body was like <laughs> and i was 25 26 years old i was like wow you know i don't know if i could want to go through another six months of this i get pretty beat up but it didn't it wasn't a psychological thing where i wanted to quit at all i read ben greenfield's um blog recap of Kokoro and one of the moments he talks about was they I think they you guys took him on a 10 mile night hike or something and they popped him in a van the heat was going they had some soft music playing and everybody was exhausted of course and they took him to a Denny's or an IHOP or something and said go in and get whatever you want to eat and of course everybody charges in there they're starving they're ordering pancakes and syrup and everything else and stuffing themselves. And the next thing they go, okay, get back in the van. <laughs> and I think they took them back and they had to go to the beach or something and start running down the beach. And they wanted to go have a sleep, but just on the nutrition, obviously sure. I know you've talked about how your diets changed and, and how you fuel yourself. You're, you're talking when you, when people go to Kokoro and we can get into that a bit, you're, you've got people coming from, Again, uh, special ops candidates, elite athletes, uh, civilian high achievers, people coming from all different backgrounds. They've all got boo programming. Um, Kokoro, the Crucible, maybe you could talk about about that program and, and how that all links in with Unbeatable Mind and the whole process. How you, you know, where people are going there, obviously, because they want more out of themselves. They want to become more... Uh, become leaders in their community, give back to their community, but they know they're missing something. And obviously they're going there to tap into that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I created seal fit first because I wanted to teach other seals and special operators, these things that I had learned that allowed, you know, for such a different experience, you know, that I, like I've been talking about, especially these big four skills, but it was more than that. And the fourth skill, by the way, we never got to, but that was just radical task focus on the smallest, thing that you could micro you know, conjure up the micro goal right and so we started teaching those to uh, seals first i i had um, i was working with naval special warfare group one to create uh, or to, to develop and run a big certification exercise for deploying uh, combat units seals and um i have i i discovered that i had a, a talent for developing innovative training programs you know in that time it was like 2004 2005 and um and then that led me to them or them to hire me to develop a nationwide mentoring program for navy seal candidates it was a government contract I, I didn't really know much about government contracting and i literally had the whole thing stolen from me uh, a year later by blackwater usa yeah. which is a huge company and, and you know that stung a little bit but um I went back to my med, you know, I sat in my meditation bench and I was like, you know, asked the question, do I want to fight these guys? And I said, no. And I, what I really wanted to do was to, to even be more innovative than I could on a government contract and to, to teach these guys uh, 
you know, as a private company. So I started SealFit. And so um, with SealFit, I initially built these 30 day academies, which is like a, like a Shaolin monastery for spec ops guys. And they would come live with me on site at my training center in Encinitas, California. And we trained for 30 days straight. And, um, you know, from five in the morning till 10 at night. And then the grudge and no, only one day off, right? This whole 30 days. We did a full hand-to-hand -hand combat training, you know, certification within it. We did all the ocean work, all the pool work, you know, all the... Uh, you know, all the leadership and team development, all the, you know, all the physical training you can imagine, you know, full CrossFit, all the modalities, strength training, you know, Olympic lifting, log PT, you know, austere fitness, everything that I could think of, I created. And out of that came uh, three different, you know, three different civilian training programs. One was eight weeks to seal fit, which you, you mentioned earlier. And, um, that was the whole seal fit training, physical tra physical and mental training protocol. And then the durability, recovery, and kind of um, practice of alignment and integration, I called Kokoro Yoga, which is like a yoga practice for, for men mostly. And, um, and, and a lot of the practices of breathing and meditation are built into that. And then the third is, is called Unbeatable Mind, which is really the philosophical framework for how do you develop your mind to its fullest potential to include you know your emotions your intuition so it's a process of integrated development you've probably heard of the five mountains physical mental emotional intuitional and, and kokoro or spiritual and so i those all came out of the 30-day academies that i ran for like three years now the the graduation ceremony for those 30-day academies was a initially a 36 hour nonstop training evolution that I had modeled after hell week. And um, it really was just meant for these guys that I built this 30 day program for, but I had a bunch of people in Encinitas who were at my CrossFit gym who wanted to do it. And so I, I charged them, you know, like seven or 800 bucks and they, they joined my seal candidates to do this event once. And, um, and then we was like, oh man, there's a product here. And so we put it on our website we called the Seal Fit Challenge. And then later on, about we did it that way for about three or four times. And then we increased it to 50 hours. And I changed the name to Kokoro Camp because um, I just love this idea of transformation. The transformation that was happening with the people, both the SEAL candidates who had already been training for, for 28 days or so, and the civilians who were going into it uh, cold, th there was something really magical happening during this 50 hours of nonstop training, no sleep. And, um, and Kokoro, the word means merging your heart and mind into your actions or whole mind. And so uh, that's what we call this training program. And so then that has continued to this day, even though I haven't run one of those 30 day academies now, like eight years or you know, we used to do the 30 days went down to three weeks, which I think is what Ben did, or maybe he did one week with us. And then it went down to one week and then we did it in three days. And so we just, I, you know, we just ran the course of different formats for it until like um, COVID hit. And then we just stopped doing those things altogether, but we kept the crucibles, you know? So now we, we have a six, 12, 24 and 50 hour crucible, which are these nonstop intense training events. The training model is very similar to BUDS or, or like a special ops training where, you know, the 30 days or the academy was like phases, you know, one, two, and three. And then the 50 hour event is like hell week, which is a very different training model, you know, than anything else that happens during the nine months of BUDS. Hell week is a different model. And it, we call it a crucible where you the pressure is so intense and so high because of the nonstop training no classroom. It's just nonstop physical, mental, hardcore team-based training, and you don't sleep. So that training was designed by Navy SEALs for Navy SEALs um, to prepare them for the most extreme environments in combat, right? Putting it all together, right? Yeah. 
so they knew that seals needed to operate on in this you know on the sea in the air on the land that's why we call sea air land and so what's the worst environment you can think in every one of those right and so land it might be the desert or the jungle and the sea it might be a raging you know storm in the middle of the sea or you're underwater in a dangerous environment and the air you know you're screaming through the air at 120 miles an hour and your parachute doesn't open so you got to work on your reserve so you know imagine every one of those scenarios and you're doing it and you haven't slept you know for two days that's what helped that's what a coral camp is like it's considered the hardest training in the world outside of the actual military you know navy seal training or sas training and it's transformative right it's literally the preparation for it the conduct of it and everything that happens after it. Like there's a, um, there's a, there's a, a shift because you go through this metamorphosis and you discover aspects of your being that you never knew you even had, right? It's not like, oh, I'm gonna, I've identified this gap and I'm gonna close this gap. Like you identify things that you didn't even know existed. Right, and then you have to overcome them. And so you go through like twenty different heroes' journeys in fifty hours during this this event. It's extraordinary. Not everyone makes it. You know, we try really hard to get everyone through the event, but generally speaking, you know, we have a lot of people who spend years training for it. On average, you you got to spend at least nine, six to nine months training, even if you're a, a hardcore athlete. It's just it's easy to get injured with that type of load. But the preparation. And the conduct of the event and the bond you develop with the teammates that, and the coaches, you know, who are really care about you. You know, our coaches are world class. They're not, you know, like the typical what you'd see on TV if someone, you know, just in your face. These these coaches are like, you know, they're your friends and they want you, but they're going to hold you to the, this impeccably high standard. It's higher than you've ever imagined holding yourself to. So that's Kokoro Camp is extraordinary, and we run it twice a year, really as a service. You know, as imagine, you know, imagine how much work that goes into that, and we don't charge much money for it because we want people to come. But um, you know, we might have a, a seventy or seventy-five people show up for an event, and, and maybe twenty to twenty-five will finish it. Um, I read some. One of the instructors mentioned at some point in an article I read that as you just said, they care and they want everybody to get through, but at the same time, you need to earn it. And obviously, yeah. you, if you get through and, and, it, and it wasn't earned, then that diminishes the value of the whole program. Right. But, you know, coming back to my next question, I suppose, is with, with you, Mark Devine, all the things that you've done and where you're at now, what, what's your daily routine in terms of earning your trident every day? <laughs> I earn my trident every day. What still, do you, yeah. what, what's a day in the life of Mark Devine like? Well, I'm, I'm up at, you know, either before six, but no later than six. And I train from six until 10. Um, so that training has me do my morning ritual, uh, which is you know, breathing and meditation and journaling um, for an hour and a half, really, it's a long time. And I do that with my wife, it's, it's, it's an awesome time period. So that's when I went in my mind. And um, then I have a smoothie, then I head up to my training center and then I do my, uh, I do another you know, half hour, 45 minutes of yoga and meditation. And then I do my functional fitness workout, you know, which is basically a seal fit wad. I don't do it as long as I used to because I don't need to, but all that. Then I get in the hyperbaric chamber and, uh, you know, uh, spend a little bit of time in there. And all that I, I, I'm done either, uh, depending on the chamber ride and what else I got going on, um, try to get that done by 10. So I, I prioritize there's four hours of my day for, um, you know, five mountain training, physical, mental, emotional, intuition, and spiritual. And I'll never change that. It's just so powerful. And the five mountain do people can read read about in the book, but the five mountain right. training, uh, go yeah. ahead. No, and then, you know, then I try, you know, for when it comes to what you would typically call work, I'm very fluid and dynamic with that. Like I have the part of my morning ritual is to determine what's the most important thing I've got to do today. And I make sure that I do that. And so I keep myself very, very, my schedule very focused on the, the, the most critical, important, and urgent things. 
And then, you know, I'll just keep a running list of other things that I want to get done. Now, this gets a little tricky because I'm getting my PhD right now, which is a, I'm finishing something I started before I went to combat. I didn't finish it because of combat back in 2004, but I'm getting my doctorate in global leadership and change. And, you know, I've got this podcast and I'm, you know, I'm writing my sixth book and I'm running two, you know, my businesses and my nonprofit. So time management, just like with everyone else, is a real um, focus of mine. So I, you know, I'm very, very cautious with what I allow into my schedule and I've got an assistant to help me with that. But um, the way that I work is to be radically focused on stuff like this. And then I'll take a break and I'll clear my mind and I'll do a, a, a spot trip or a practice. Right? And so that adds to my overall practice time, which I think is awesome. And um, when it comes to new food or fueling, you know, I have my morning smoothie and then I'll eat a light lunch and then I'll eat a, you know, pretty healthy meal at dinner time. But food is, um, food has become really simple for me. You know, I, I, I'm really a principle based liver, right? I don't complicate things. And so um, I eat when I'm hungry. I eat healthy stuff for the most part. But some, once in a while, you know, I'll have a pizza. You know, I just, it, you know, 80 20 rule. As long as, yeah, it's just like everything else. As long as you're, if you're training five days a week and the other two days you don't do a damn thing, that's fantastic. So nutrition is the same way. If you're eating extremely well 80% of the time and having pizza and ice cream the other 20% of the time is actually good for you because it keeps you motivated and, and, and you're not in a deprivation, you know kind of psychological state. So I enjoy, um, you know, some things that other people might think aren't good for you, but you know, my health is extraordinary. And yeah. you know I mean? <laughs> I'm 58 years old and I can still train as hard as like, you know, young guys. Absolutely. Um, consistency Mark, of effort is key. Yeah. Consistency of effort, which is one of the things that we talked about. Uh, I just want to say, I, I know we've, we sort of probably run our time limit and um, a couple funny stories that remind people if they go to Kokoro or they do grinder PT with Mark, don't ever spit on the grinder. <laughs> yeah, that and um, I just, one of the things maybe you could mention the, uh, the burpee challenge, you're raising money for uh, vets. Uh, was it a 2 million, 22 million burpees? Yeah. We, we, um, we do something every year called Burpees for Vets. And uh, it started out in 2018 when I started the Courage Foundation, which just helped vets with post-traumatic stress and suicide, um, try to really chip away at that. And so I had this crazy harebrained idea to do a lot of burpees. And uh, so I, I, I challenged my tribe, you know, to do 22 million burpees because 22 vets a day were committing suicide. And that was a big goal to chew on you know so we um, i ended up doing 130,000 that year and, and a number of other people you know joined me to do over 100,000 and, and uh, we had football teams you know cranking out as many burpees as they could in you know two hours we had all sorts of different efforts and we tracked every single burpee and we finally it took us a year and a half we did 22 million burpees we raised 300,000 dollars and broke two world records in the process wow, that's amazing that's <laughs> how cool incredible. is that so now every year in Veterans Day, we do an event with Seal Fit where we have influencers come and we film it and we, we do this for burpees for vets. And we raised, last year we raised, I think, 40,000. 40, this year we're shooting for 100,000. Yeah. Wow. So that's a Veteran Day initiative. You can learn more about that if you want to participate at burpeesforvets.com or at our CourageFoundationUSA.org website. Yeah. And if you're interested in the seal fit stuff, those, those events that I talked about, Kokoro that you were at, we run that twice a year. And uh, we have got one actually this coming weekend. So it's in uh, September and April. I'll include the links for all of that uh, in cool. this. And Mark, I, I just want to say with absolute gratitude, thank you for your time. Uh, the book Seal Fit, Eight Weeks to Seal Fit, Unbeatable Mind, uh, The Way of the Seal, the new book, uh, what's it going to be titled? Uncommon. Uncommon. I love it. And when's it yeah. uh, possibly going to be due out? That's um, shooting to get that out before the end of the year. Self-publishing. Um, is there anything in closing that, that if you could sum, I mean, obviously part of the goal of, of talking today is to hopefully empower people to 
if they're if they're in a position or in a place where they need to make change or they or they're already making success and progress but they want to get better uh, I mean gosh there's just so many things we could continue to talk about but uh, is there anything that that you would sum up I guess in closing what you could share with people yeah I mean I, we have covered a lot of territory and I appreciate you let me just do it through story. It was kind of fun. Uh, if things feel tough for you, for anybody listening, it, just acknowledge that that's normal, right? And, and, and life is not meant to be easy necessarily, but it can, it can be easy. And the, and the secret lies between your head, between your ears. Um, life gets easy when you get very clear about why why you're doing what you're doing and what you're supposed to be doing. And so the time you should be spending is the time to, to really discover those things, discover what you're supposed to be doing. And when you're doing what you're doing, why you're doing it and to develop a why, a strong why, for why you're doing it. And if you can do that, great, then it'll get easy. And if you can't, then you're clearly doing the wrong thing. So I think this is kind of like a meta message here is like, we all have a calling in life. We all have a reason. We all have a, a fabulous gift to bring to the world. And if we don't discover that and bring it to the world, then life is gonna, it's gonna be really freaking hard. It's gonna feel like a struggle. But if you could take the time and learn to quiet your mind and go inside and uncover what this is or uncover a better way to bring it to the world and develop the courage, feed the courage wolf to do that in spite of what everyone else says, especially your parents, man, then you find everything suddenly gets simple and joyful and the world literally will rush to your aid. Right? So that's how to make things easy is to not just keep pushing or not this, you know, the mental toughness is really about this it's about aligning with your purpose because once you do that you know everything gets easier and and quitting becomes completely silly like it's not an option because it's you know it's just who you are it's the title unbeatable mind yeah beautiful mind is is the answer right and there's so much great information in there i mean what I found most powerful about all of your material, Mark, is that it's it's not just the, the philosophy, it's the practical tools that enable you to put it into practice every single day into any area of your life. And uh, again, I'm uh, extremely grateful for your time and uh, for people who want to follow up further and learn more from Mark, uh, you can get his books. I'll have the links below as well for Kokoro and SealFit and Unbeatable Mind Academy. Uh, Mark, thanks. Thank you so much. It's been thanks, an Jason. absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, you rock. Yeah. For more information on Mark Devine, the Unbeatable Mind Academy, or SealFit, Kokoro Camps, and any of the other materials of Mark Devine, you can go to unbeatablemind.com. Forging a Unbeatable Mindset breakthrough performance, discipline, confidence, and a winning mindset to master any task in your life. Thank you for stopping by. Enjoy the rest of your day and become unbeatable.